Good morning all, and a warm welcome to the launch of the UCT DVC for Transformations Anti-Racism Conversation Series. I am Quentin Follis. I will be the program director for today. It is wonderful to see you all here, and I'm really, really excited to be here with you this morning. We have Prof. Adam Hout and Dr. Loazi Lushaba with us today. So why anti-racism, you might ask? Well, in June 2022, UCT released the new anti-racism policy and related procedures. This intentional shift towards an anti-racist approach acknowledges that as an institution, we operate within a system with structures in society that perpetuate inequality and injustice. Economic disparities result from this, leading to many forms of exclusion which affect the economy. Addressing this through staff recruitment, organizational ethos, research, as well as teaching and learning is the work of a university that has a vision which embraces social justice. Anti-racism work fits well with the objectives of the UCT dismantling the racism strategy, which forms part of the UCT inclusivity strategy. To amplify this work, the UCT conversation series is launched this year with the first theme focused on anti-racism. It is through scholarly debate and intellectual engagement that UCT as a leading academic institution can advance social justice. Our host today is Prof. Alawani Ramugandu. A little bit about our DVC. Professor Alawani Ramugandu was appointed as Deputy Vice Chancellor for, responsible for transformation, student affairs and social responsiveness at the University of Cape Town from 1st July 2022. She was a Deputy Dean for Postgraduate Education at the Faculty of Health Sciences, UCT. She obtained all her qualifications from UCT. As a newly qualified OT, she established the first occupational therapy department at Chilidzini Special School in Popo Province, South Africa. She returned to UCT as an academic in 1998, having served as an OT in rural South Africa and the United States of America. Alawani's work at UCT over the past 23 years has focused on leading with integrity, recognizing this to be pivotal in advancing transformation and excellence as interdependent and interlinked concepts. She is the founding member of the UCT Black Academic Caucus, has been its vice chairperson and a member of its executive committee until recently. She served three years as a warden within UCT's student housing and residence life from July 26th to July 2020. She was a member of the UCT Council. She also has served as chair of UCT Academic Freedom Committee, which hosted five successful TB Davy lectures under her leadership. She's the current member of the advisory board for UCT's African Gender Institute as head of division for OT Alawani led a division which became the most diverse OT program both nationally and internationally in terms of its staff and students. During this time, she also spearheaded curriculum transformation aimed towards a graduate profile that is responsive to the local context while being globally competitive. Alawani's decolonial approach to teaching and convening postgraduate courses has received international recognition, leading to numerous invitations to lead symposia for postgraduate students and faculty in South America, United Kingdom and South America. She is often invited to give keynote addresses on transforming higher education or decolonizing the academy, both nationally and abroad. She convened the inaugural UCT Decolonial Summer School and is a regular speaker at the University of Kozulu Natal Decolonial Summer School. Alawani was appointed Special Advisor on Transformation to the Vice Chancellor at UCT in 2015 in response to the student led roads must fall movement's call for decolonization. She later became a member of the Strategic Executive Task Team during one of the most tumultuous times in the university's history. In these roles, she participated in complex, highly charged, faculty-based and institutional-wide dialogues on decolonization and decoloniality. She was instrumental in crafting the UCT Curriculum Change Framework, which is centered on decoloniality and was released to the public in June 2018. Alawani has served on numerous boards for non-NGOs, non sorry, included Kids Positive, um, which was the first to facilitate access to antiretroviral treatment for children born with HIV. She is currently the chair of the Rhodes Scholarship Western and Northern Cape Selection Committee. I will introduce our speakers a bit later. Without further ado, let me hand over to Prof. Ella Wanirama to do the official welcome. Thank you for those uh, wonderful words um, introducing me. Uh, really humbling. Uh, thank you very much. Moloen. Uh, and welcome again um, to the launch of this conversation series under the broad goal 
of building a scholarship on transformation at the University of Cape Town. If it were not for the fact that our vice chancellor is lending today in this very moment in the country from an important visit at the University of Miami in the United States of America, where she gave resoundingly successful talks, she would be welcoming you to this event. The University of Cape Town is a great university. It hosts great thinkers who are shaped in their thinking by the very context we find ourselves, South Africa, and more broadly, the continent. These thinkers can be found across all our campus spaces. They are our students, academics, and professional academic support staff. Many of these great thinkers, unsurprisingly, are passionate about transformation. For they know, consistent with our vision 2030, that without it, there can be no excellence and no sustainability. And we speak of sustainability across its three components, social, environmental, and financial. To understand exactly how transformation, excellence, and sustainability are intricately linked, we need to build a scholarship on transformation. Given our diversity and complexity as a society, still grappling with the legacies of colonization and apartheid and drawing from each of our own body, biographical, geopolitical, epistemic positioning, what we can build as a scholarship on transformation will necessarily be richly generative and unique. Our intention is to have this work be both diagnostic in that it helps us understand our problems deeply, but also practice oriented in that it must help us figure out how to solve these problems through everyday practice, including what we get paid to do as employees, but also how we treat each other as fellow humans. We launched this conversation series with a focus on our first theme, anti-racism. The choice of this theme is not incidental. It arises from the fact, as you heard from Quinton, that we've just recently, as a university, approved our new policy on anti-racism. The debates that we witnessed and participated in as part of the approval process, both in Senate and in Council, made it clear that definitions matter and that both the theoretical and ideological aspects of terms such as non-racialism and anti-racism cannot be taken for granted, that they need to be unpacked and debated. It is for this very reason that the launch of this conversation series starts with interlocutors on anti-racism, drawing from their own ongoing scholarship. But before I hand over back to our program director, Quinton, I wish to acknowledge the presence of our UNESCO colleagues, whom we are hosting for this week for a workshop on anti-Black racism, which coincided with the launch of our conversation series. Ultimately, racism claims real victims, and the ultimate consequence of racism is death. Racism and its consequence, death, are most brutal and vicious for those who call out oppression and are seen to be obstacles to a system that seeks to dehumanize and subject marginalized populations to second class citizenship. I now hand back to our program director, Quinton. Thank you. Thanks so, so much, Professor Awani. I think we are all excited for today. Um, we'll have two speakers today, namely um, Prof. Adam Hout and Prof. Luazel Shaba. Um, they'll each have 30 minute slots, and let me introduce our first speaker to you. 
Uh, the presentation will be entitled The Case for an Anti-Racism Policy. This presentation explores the way in which race is socially and politically constructed by making distinctions between systemic racism and interpersonal prejudice. Professor Adam Hout is the director of the Center for Film and, Film and Media Studies. He is co-editor of Never Again, Hip Hop Art, Activism and Education in Post-Apartheid South Africa with Quentin Williams, Emil Jansen and Sammy Alim. Prof. Adam Hout is coordinating editor of Global Hip Hop Studies with Prof. Jay Griffith, Rulofsen, University of College Cork in Ireland. And he serves on the advisory board for the first hip hop book series by University of California Press. We are elated to have you. Welcome, Professor Adam Hart. Thanks, Quentin. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Uh, really great to be uh, part of this conversation and set the conversation game. Let me start by sharing my screen. You can see it, I trust. Just, Quentin, let me know if I'm not sharing my screen. Uh, um, you can all see it. Can see. Perfect. OK, let's begin. So. This started off as a conversation between myself and 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 Cyan, and um, it started with I think the the point of entry was the um, Senate meeting, and so I thought that I would offer a slightly more structured uh, take on systemic racism, and so if you were in the Senate meeting, you heard me make that point. This is going to be less of a ramble and slightly more structured. Um, these were the um, oops, give me a second. I get my next slide. Oh, OK, that's why. Right, these were the sorts of questions, the ballpark, I think, broadly speaking, that we're operating. We're not going to get all, to all of them. Um, and I think the point of the conversation series is to answer the first question. Why is it even necessary? Why do we even need a policy? Um, and so I'm going to speak to some of this. There's not going to be a lot of time to talk about intersectional approaches. You should know that the material that I'm drawing on comes from my inaugural lecture, 2019 inaugural lecture, but then also lectures that I do for the media major um, and scholarly writing that I do on, on you know, uh, approaches to systemic racism, uh, intersectional approaches to oppression, um, the exercise of agency. And so I do a lot of that work in collaboration with not just intellectual property scholars, uh, less so these days than, than I used to. Um, I spend a lot of time with social linguists looking at black multilingual politics and translanguaging and so on. Um, so this is sort of ballpark. If we get to all of these issues, fantastic. Uh, I can I can speak talk in 30 minutes. But so I'm going to start off with just a, a quick uh, snapshot of arguments about interpersonal racism and systemic racism. Um, I think um, my colleague Luazi would probably talk about, you know, the history of biological essentialism and scientific racism. I know that he has done that in his lectures, and I know there was a, a bit of a social media meltdown in which his arguments were misrepresented. So I, I won't labor that point. I suspect he will go down that road. I'm also conscious of the fact that Dr. Wandile Kasebe is in the room and he has quite a lot to say about, about uh, memory and, and, and the, the, um, the complicity of institutions and um, in, in, in the collection of, of, of human uh, remains um, and treating them as, as, as uh, scholarly curiosities. And so the complicity of scientists and academics broadly in, in essentially genocide. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there are co colleagues like Dr. Kasebe in the room, we can talk about that, so I won't belabor that point. So I'm really going to largely focus on, like I said, making the distinction between interpersonal and systemic racism, uh, talk about racist social and politically constructed, and then talk about institutional complicity and point to some of the ways in which institutions are complicit in systemic racism and uphold systems. So let's just start with that distinction in my mind, I make uh, a distinction between interpersonal racism, basically prejudice, prejudice that behold, uh, it can either be articulated clearly, uh, it can be performed in social situations, it doesn't always have to be spoken, it, it doesn't have to be overt, it doesn't even have to be uh, witting, it can be unwitting. So we can be unwittingly racist as we might be unwittingly sexist and homophobic and transphobic, right? 
And what reinforces, I think, people's lack of critical thinking about their prejudice, the interpersonal prejudice, is that a lot of these, um, you know, uh, ideologies are actually sustained by systems. And so systemic racism or systemic uh, gender oppression uh, works in particular where there are political, legal, military, economic and educational mechanisms that, that, that work over generations that ensure that, that, you know, people classified as white and heterosexual, for example, um, continue to receive material and symbolic privileges. Um, even in the case of 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 of, of a post apartheid in South Africa, you might have a context where uh, legislative apartheid has fallen, um, but the, you know the institutional systems and structures, the, some of the legal structures, certainly the, the the economic systems and structures are very much in place that you know it continues to sustain racialized, gendered, and classed. Uh, hierarchies and, and forms of marginalization. And I think that is what the anti-racism policy is attempting to, to, to speak to, uh, to unpack, to dismantle those systems, those structures that ensure that um, a number of rights that remain paper rights in, 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 in our post-94 dispensation, that those rights actually become, uh, you know, real. And so, you know, as I was saying, you can be racist without being racist. You know, you can have racism in effect without actually being racist. As I say to my undergrad students, you can be a good person in your heart of hearts, but continue to benefit from systemic racism and sexism. So essentially, the systems that you know that that that, that create um, you know the, these inequalities, unless you dismantle those systems and take them apart and and reconfigure relations in power uh, in in ways that are equitable, that 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 you know that restore. Um, that are restorative and that are distributive, um, and justly so. That unless you undo that, you know, you're going to continue to benefit from from the, from these inequities. And so it is almost immaterial whether you hold prejudice in your heart of hearts, uh, whether you act out uh, forms of prejudice. Um, you know, um, you can be complicit in systemic oppression. And um, I like to use a chapter from a book by Eusebius Mekeza. Um, he talks about, um, you know, unearned privilege. Um, you know, you could have, you know, you have this privilege. You've done nothing to earn white privilege uh, simply by being white and male and heterosexual. Uh, you enjoy a, a, a position of power, symbolic capital. Uh, you have a particular set of advantages that are built into our systems, right? Um, that that continue to, to to function in the way that they do, and I'll get to how they they continue to function in ways that are, are unjust in a second. But just to sort of acknowledge arguments about you know the complicity of of anthropologists, scientists, sociologists in 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 um, in in. in you know, shaping the ways in which race is understood. And people like uh, David Theo Goldberg and, and, and Sussman actually will say, you know, in, in Western history, the concept of race is a very, very recent concept. It isn't until we have the shift to from from uh, from a feudalist to capitalist society that that people come to be racialized because there are political and economic incentives behind justifying um, the dispossession of people of of their land, their resources, the dispossession of of of, of people from their bodies, and and this is how people come to be racialized. And, and one of the outcomes of the racializations of colonized people is eugenics, and I think this is. Um, a point that Lawazi was making before this 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 big social media meltdown, and and as I said, I think his views were misrepresented. Um, thanks to you know World War II eugenics came to be discredited, and 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 um, you know the act of Europeans um, you know uh, oppressing, um, murdering en masse other fellow Europeans that 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 led to sort of a critical take. Uh, a realization that eugenics is this discredited form of science. It's poor scholarship. It's unethical. Um, and as Lawazi said, it, you know, we know that there is a history that precedes the genocide in, 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 in of, of World War Two. We know that in present day Namibia, indigenous people were, uh, you know, were um, um, 
victims of genocide. And this is where research on, 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 the, on, on the repatriation of human remains, uh, that's where that scholarship comes in, that scholarship and activism. And so there's a long history of um, scientists, but broadly speaking, uh, institutions of higher learning universities being complicit in genocide, being complicit in de facto cultural appropriation. And um, so there's quite a bit of activism and scholarship that acknowledges this history that points to uh, institutional complicity in racism and misogyny. So flying through that. Um, and of course, now you have journal articles, you know, it doesn't get more mainstream like this, uh, a journal like Science actually uh, thinking critically about how to dismantle systemic racism in science, just to acknowledge the scholarship. It's a fairly recent publication. Yes, 2020. Um, but what I want to focus on, and I think this is what happened during Roads Must Fall and Fears Must Fall, people began to realize that the curriculum needs to be decolonized. And, and one avenue in which you can decolonize the curriculum is to think critically about language and how our schooling system and uh, you know, the tertiary education sector continues to privilege uh, linguistic imperialism. Um, and so we're meant to be operating in a context that is uh, multilingual, um, but in actual fact, we are still largely bi or monolingual. Our institutions still largely push Afrikaans and English as a medium of instruction. And, and there are a number of sort of um, neo-colonial racist and classist assumptions that, that, that go with it. So my favorite moment coming out of my research is, is a documentary by my colleague, Dylan Valley. Uh, he made a documentary on the hip hop theater show called Afrikaans. And in the documentary, the, the, the cast goes to schools and they, they, they engage young people about language, race, identity, and belonging, especially around the use of cops. And you know, as you would know, my, 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 my collaborators, and I, collaborators and I have been working on the first ever trilingual dictionary on cops led by my, 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 my main co-conspirator, Quentin Williams, conspirator, um, Quentin Williams, who is at UWC. And so this is a scene, this is actually ironically an English translation of, of, of this, this learner's point. If someone interviewed me and I'm talking, and I didn't hear them properly. And basically, if I drop my guard and I just speak like I normally speak, sorry, brother, what did you know, Jose? Um, if I drop my guard and I speak like I really speak, then immediately he's going to get the impression that I'm a gangster, regardless of whether I have a degree or how intelligent I am. Um, he's going to judge me by the language that I use. For one question, he's going to judge me for that job. I'm not going to get that job, right? And so, um, this learner realizes that there are certain linguistic performances that assure employers or educators about your black respectability. And so this is how respectability politics, how we are socialized at school into a particular kind of racialized and gendered and classed, classed uh, respectability politics, because behind the mode of speech that he's alluding to lies the sort of uh, the, 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 the hegemonic stereotype of the, the, the colored gangster, the toothless drug dealing, you know, colored gangster. It's both class, racialized and gendered. So we see this happening in the classroom space. These are actual, you know, sound bites from past course evals. I, I, I've been convening a median society, a first year course. And, and if you could take sample and look back at, at some of the, the comments that people have made, these are typical kinds of comments uh, that, that come through my lecture to speak with an accent. Even one year, actually beginning of 2015, someone asked to leave my cut group because she couldn't handle the way I speak. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, so accent is a marker of competence, um, you know, in, in, in model, former model C schools, present, present SGB schools, in, in private schools, people continue to be, uh, um, you know, schooled into thinking that a particular kind of linguistic performance in English will signal your competence, uh, the fact that you're not tardy, that you have your act together, that you're intelligent, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's where that, that, that cliche comes from. You speak so well, and to this day, people still say that to, 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 to young black people, you speak so well, meaning well, um, right? And so essentially what is happening is people's translingual and multilingual repertoire is actually re continues to be read as a deficit. And that impacts upon the way in which learners are assessed in, 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 in a schooling context and in the university, university context. Right. And so this is where the, the concept of, of, of double consciousness comes in. 
Let's see if I remember to, to put this in my next slide, double consciousness. No, let me just leave it. Um, let me just pause there. So basically, double consciousness, you know, Dubois, um, you're measuring yourself by the tape of a world that looks upon you with contempt and pity. Um, that quote uh, resonates in, in, in approaches to schooling, and I think that is something worth knowledge, acknowledging. And so in, in a sense, you know, uh, biologically essentialist understandings of race, yes, came to be discredited by eugenics, but you have cultural racism taking its place and we have a particular understanding of race uh, that into which we are socialized um, that that positions that reinforces apartheid era hierarchies and a good example of that is is in approaches to hegemonic approaches to colored identity that continues to see coloredness as a mixture of races as if black and white are these pure unbounded entities and coloredness is created in black as if it's one thing and white as if it's one thing um, when those two things come together and uh, the scholarship that, that that i like is is work by zimitri erasmus that questions the very constructedness of race and questions assumptions uh, um, that are made when, when when people refer to race mixture or biracial interracial um and and you know it, it draws on the history of miscegenation which we, we thought we, has already been discredited so just to sort of very quickly how am i doing for time quentin You have 15 minutes left. 10 minutes, okay. 15. Oh, 15. Oh, good. Wow. Okay. So essentially, whose interests are served by hegemonic discourses on race and by extension gender? Um, let's just take a quick snapshot at some of some arguments that I've thrown at students and, and at people in in, in, uh, in in scholarly context. Some of my research looks at intellectual property and the history of commons enclosure. And what I'll argue is that, you know, the construction of race or a particular construction of race was really meant to justify the dehumanization of, of, of colonized people, to justify the dispossession of people of land resources, the right to property, the right to property in their body. And so um, I found the work of John Locke a very, very interesting John Locke's argument, uh, the following argument, every man having rights of property in his body should be justly rewarded for the fruits of his labor. That argument became the sort of the, the kickstarter for uh, a piece of legislation called the Statute of Anne, which is sort of the first modern legislative pronouncement on intellectual property. It influenced not just um, the Statute of Anne and the U.S. Uh, version of the Statute of Anne, which, you know, covers trademarks, intellectual property and copyright, but also beyond that, it covers a particular understanding of property ownership, but then also the freedom to contract, contract law, and places the individual as the fountainhead of protection. It makes uh, its engine a particular individual's conception of ownership and, and contracting, um, you know, and, and, and becomes a sort of, sort of, point of entry into understanding a particular kind of logic, I should say, that 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 makes individualist accumulation, accumulation of wealth that is collectively produced possible. So under intellectual property law, or, 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 you know, um, if the individual is the fountainhead of protection, what that means is that approaches to intellectual property is um, essentially uncomprehending of collective production of knowledge, collective production of wealth. Uh, and if that becomes a sort of a, a key part of our approach to intellectual property and 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 other uh, uh, you know approaches to property that property law it places us at loggerheads with the, with the logic of the commons. Um, and what I argue in my research is that commons enclosure is a good way for understanding how colonialism functioned. Um, the law uh, embedded in the law is this approach which is individualist that 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 allows for individualist dispossession of a collective uh, either of its intellectual property of 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 of, of wealth of resources and so, so this is the sort of moment i would say it's not the only moment the sort of lock logic uh, assists in a transition in you know um, from one approach to intellectual property to another but also it assists in the transition from feudalism to capitalism and if you want to sort of um, get a nice 
brief uh, snapshot of that argument, check out this 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 paper, this this op-ed that I wrote for the conversation recently. I think it explains the point I was trying to make much more eloquently. Um, so commons, enclosure, and colonial dispossession, those two concepts work together. Uh, what does this have to do with uh, with with um, no time for the summer to skip this? What does this have to do with us at UCT? A big part of the problem with the transition to a post-apartheid sort of dispensation is that we didn't just adopt uh, a fantastic consti constitution. The fact is that we adopted neoliberal economics, right? And um, we did more than that. We basically adopted an, a macroeconomic policy gear, which is a structural adjustment program on, on steroids. And um, in the interest of time, whoops, I'm going to argue that um, the sort of neoliberal paradigm brought to us by people like Reagan and Thatcher has now extended into, you know, the university context. And we are now dealing with the corporate university. And one of the ways in which we see the, you know, corporatization of, of, of higher learning taking place is, 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 is in the context of, 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 of scholarship. Uh, we operate in an environment where, um, we, you know, we are told, you know, publish or perish. You've got to get out the numbers. You've got to be publishing in top tier journals with top tier uh, um, publishers, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with that logic is scholarship gets reduced to a numbers game, which is incredibly neoliberal. Um, but also the top five um, publishers uh, account for 50 percent of global market share. All of those Top, you know, all of those publishers are from the global north. So the Alsa Fairs, the Tail and Francis, Rutledge, all of those journals are from the global north. The gatekeeping continues to happen in the global north. Uh, you have this monopolist, actually this oligopoly, uh, um, operating in academic publishing. What I argue in my own research is that that is not unlike what you see in other kinds of media industries, whether it's, you know, news media with, you know, News Corp and Fox, or whether it is the music industry, we have about three or four holding companies dominating 80% global market share. So scholarly publishing is, is no exception. The ironic thing about this is that the labor that goes into generating value for these journals, all of that labor is free. Whether you write an article, do peer reviews, edit a special issue or edit a journal, you don't get a salary. The idea is that you know your university pays your salary and the university spends uh, you know, taxpayers' money to, to, to pay to, you know, for subscriptions to journals. Um, and it becomes a sort of um, really exploitative cycle. There's a lot of free labor that goes into generating value for these brands. It's not unlike Facebook. Um, and then in the end, we are charged an arm and a leg for subscriptions to these journals, all right? And so this is how you know, corporates manage to enclose a knowledge commons uh, with our participation. Um, and so it goes beyond that. Uh, I would argue, actually, it's not my argument. Eve J would argue that the citation indices are neocolonial. It comes out of a particular history uh, that um, created a sort of an, an iniquity between global south and global north. Former colonies don't get to be gatekeepers of knowledge production. Um, you know, the indices reinforce racialized um, inequities um, that ensure that hierarchies of knowledge and sort of epistemic gatekeeping functions um, even in a democratic dispensation. Um, to remind you of Delgado's work, uh, Delgado talks about uh, the racial and gendered bias in, 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 in citations. Uh, we continue to part participate in that problem. Uh, there's definitely a, a, a racial bias in, 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 in citation practices that reinforces canonical power and gatekeeping within the global north. Um, and so my answer to this to this problem is that you know, in order to, to decolonize uh, scholarship, um, we need to decommodify knowledge and UCT does have an answer to this, has had an answer. The Open Scholarship Project, Open Education Resources, Vula, runs on Sakai, um, which is an open source engine. Uh, it is sad that they're moving away from open source to a proprietary platform with, with Brightspace. 
but this is the history that UCT has been, you know, involved in, in attempting to sort of point to different modes of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. And so um, the long and short of it is um, actually um, we do need to think critically about decolonizing the curriculum, right? But we also need to think critically about how we produce knowledge. What is the political economy within which the production of knowledge uh, is, is operating? Uh, are we using proprietary systems? Are we using systems that actually preserves the knowledge commons? Um, and so this is how the logic of, of corporatization can influence our very attempts to decolonize the curriculum. What is the point of decolonizing a curriculum if you operate in the political economy that continues to be neoliberal, that continues to corporatize functions? Uh, when you have managerialist approaches to 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 to, to you know ad, in administering a public institution, um, that is the environment within which you operate. And so, if you're going to, to really to, and truly really talk about decolonizing a curriculum, we need to think critically about de you know decommodifying a number of processes. And so, one solution that I offer in my own research is if you're going to sort of unpack systemic racism. Um, yes, a policy would help, an anti-racism policy, but we need to look at our approaches to knowledge production and dissemination, decommodify knowledge. If you want to read up a little bit more, check out uh, the last chapter from the book, Never Again. I speak about this in great detail. Um, basically, my argument is you can't decolonize knowledge without also decommodifying knowledge. Um, which is a bit of a cul-de-sac at this moment because many institutions around the world, not just in the global south, are dealing with the corporatization of higher education. Um, and until we solve that problem, we're going to be stuck. I'll stop there. I I'm pretty sure I went over time. How am I doing for time, Quentin? You did very, very well for time. We are one minute over. Um, um, so I'd really like to also just remind everybody attending today that please hold on to your questions. There will be a facilitated discussion. Um, and I'll chat a little bit about that a little, a little bit later in terms of how you can become part of the conversation. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Luazi Lushaba. And uh, maybe just before I introduce um, Dr. Luazi Lushaba, a point to ponder by Franklin Thomas. One day our descendants will think it incredible that we paid so much attention to the things like the amount of melanin in our skin or the shape of our eyes or our gender instead of the unique identities each of us as complex human beings hold. The next presentation is by Dr. Luazi Dushaba, and it is entitled From Intersectionality to Thinking the Concrete Through. Luazi Dushaba is a revolutionary intellectual he holds a PhD in political science from the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. Prior to obtaining a PhD, he was educated in various institutions, including the then University of Transkei, South Africa, where he obtained an honors degree in politics. He was in University in Nigeria, where he obtained an MA in philosophy, Center for, for Studies in Social Science and Culture, Kolkata, India, where he successfully completed an M4. He has held several teaching positions at the universities in Nigeria and South Africa. His publications include, amongst others, a co-edited book, From National Liberation to Demo Democratic Renaissance, a book titled Development as Modernity, Modernity as Development, both published by Codestria. Luazli Shaba has been a recipient of several scholarly awards. We are excited to have you, Prof. Luazli Shaba. Over to you. Quinton, thank you very much. I hope I'm audible as well as visible. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, um, Quinton, allow me, allow me thank, you know, most earnestly the, the organizers of this very important, you know, session for inviting me to come and, and palaver with you, you know, as we did in the, in the times past. And palaver with you on such an emotive subject of race and racism. As you heard, you know, from a good colleague, uh, Adam, UCT is currently, you know, in the throes, he won't put it as, you know, bluntly as I'm going to put it, but UCT is currently in the throes of a racist unfolding, you know, playing itself out 
at council and at the level of the university senate. All the things to help those who are not familiar with the developments, all the things you hear about the university, the crisis of governance, all of those are nicer ways of putting the problem of racism that the university is confronted with. But having recently adopted, you know, an anti-racist policy or anti-racism policy, the university, I suspect, would be very much well served, you know, by these conversations that have been initiated by, you know, the DVC transformation. Because I think that these conversations will or ought to help us distill our understanding, you know, of race and racism in its complex totality, because the subject of race and racism lends itself into very complex interpretations. And at times, in that complexity, we lose the clarity of thought that is necessary to advance at the level of political practice. Because it is not enough to understand at an intellectual or conceptual level what race and racism mean if that conceptual understanding does not help us advance the project of making the world that we live in less racial. So it is partly for that reason that I have styled my, or rather, you know, um, titled my conversation. Let's repeat that. I think it is for that reason that I, I have styled my, you know, presentation or contribution this morning, you know, as an attempt at a conceptual clarification. So some of the things I have assumed and many of the things that Adam was hoping I'm going to refer to, I've basically assumed them. The history of race and racism beginning from its early you know, existence in modern race science, in those disciplines that are constitutive of modern race science, be it eugenics, you know, physical anthropology. I've assumed many of those things that we do have an idea because what I want to clarify is best captured in the title of my talk, which I'm able to give to you now. So the title of my talk or of my you know, contributions this morning is From Intersectionality to Thinking the Concrete Through. I'm going to repeat that because it shapes my intellectual labor this morning. It is from intersectionality to thinking the concrete through. So what I'm going to, where I'm going to begin from, it's precisely at that point where Adam was bringing gender and race together and suggesting to us that thinking about one, you also have to think about the other. And so I'm going to speak a little and perhaps provoke you a little in the process. Because put simply, my talk is aimed at demonstrating the conceptual unhelpfulness of the concept of intersectionality, particularly for political practice. So I'm going to suggest to you that the concept that we've so much, the concept that we, we have, we have, you know, had or in some instances relied on so much called, you know, the, or rather the concept of intersectionality. I want to suggest to you as a provocation this morning that it actually falls short or hampers our attempt at advancing political practice of making the world less gendered, less racial. So the critique I want to make of intersectionality can best perhaps be compared to the critique that we make of the disciplines or modern disciplinary knowledges and their efficacy at capturing the lived experience of the black colonized. So what I'm going to try and do here is demonstrate that the critique I want to make of intersectionality is to a certain extent and to a large extent similar to the critique that we make of the modern disciplinary knowledges and their failure to capture in 
their complexity, the lived experiences of the black colonized. Now, we do know that of the disciplines that maintain this very strict or these very strict boundaries, these very strict disciplinary boundaries, we have asked of them to demonstrate to us, and thus far they have not been able to demonstrate to us. At what point do I stop being religious and start being social, and stop being social and start being anthropological, such that then my everyday lived experience or my everyday experience can then be compartmentalized into these disciplines? When you say, you want to study an anthropological existence of the black colonized, the social, or the religious. At what time of the day do they become religious? Between 8 and 10 a.m., and then they move to being social, you know, from there, henceforth. I want to suggest to you that the failure of modern disciplines is to perceive all of these all together, all at once. Modern disciplines, because of their obsession with the boundaries, with the disciplinary boundaries, aren't able to see that these things are experienced simultaneously all at once at the same time. They are joined together all at once at the same time. They are not intersectional. You don't have one in its pure form joining the other, or you don't have two experiences, race and gender, in their pure form coming together, but we'll get to that point. At this point, I'm using modern disciplinary knowledges to show that there is no point where I'm purely anthropological. There is no point where I'm purely social or purely, you know, a religious such that this experience can be taken as a purview for exclusively for religious studies, for political studies, for anthropology. This is the limit of modern disciplinary knowledges. And it is a critique of that kind that I want to extend to intersectionality. So to clarify, intersectionality, I want to suggest, is born of a supposition and an erroneous supposition that race, class, and gender as social relations and as particular expressions of the modern humanitas, and that's very important. These are particular expressions of the modern subject. These are not perennial forms of existence, no. They assume a certain significance at a particular period in the development of modern industrial society. So they do not predate gender as we know it, Class and race do not predate the modern period, the unfolding of the modern period. And so, to reiterate the point, it is that intersectionality is born of this erroneous supposition that race, class, and gender as social relations or as particular expressions of the modern humanitas each emerge in their own sphere or each image in its own specific social terrain, and then each encounters the other or intersects with the other, joins the other or cross the other aggregatively. This is the supposition of intersectionality that I suspect is very wrong. It is very similar to that, you know, Ms. Norma called multidisciplinary approach where again you suppose that people are religious and then they are political at some point so you are going to join the disciplines and you know give expression to you know that intersection or the coming together i want to suggest that intersectionality is incorrect at several levels conceptually as i'm going to demonstrate historically and socially and again as i as i make this point I must say that the intent is to advance political practice so that our political practice begins from a very clear intellectual or theoretical premise. Because 
If at the level of thought we haven't clarified the catastrophe that befell us as the black colonized at the moment of modernity, we shall not be able to transcend that catastrophe of modernity, which in a sense can be summed by these three race, class, and gender, but not as pure forms. <clears throat> so, as I said earlier, this supposition that race, class, and gender exist in pure forms, imagine different spheres, and then cross paths somehow, you know, coincidentally at some point, I want to suggest that this actually is very related, this conceptual misnomer is very related or closely related to the evolution of modern disciplines. Again, how you may wonder, and correctly so. Now, <clears throat> this is the tendency that modern disciplinary knowledges have instilled in our subconscious. And we perform this without even thinking about it. It has become a reflex, so to say. So we come to think of class as assuming a significance or it becomes a reality worthwhile or worth studying only in the minds and the laptops of political economists or scholars of political economy, especially radical political economy scholars. So what happens is that we then assume a right to say, oh no, he's privileging you know, class because he's a political economist or she's a political economist. Because reality assumes significance now on the basis of disciplinary boundaries. Gender similarly becomes a reality worthwhile scholarly only in the minds of feminist scholars and you know, their laptops just as it is that race becomes a reality only in the minds of critical race studies or scholars in critical race studies at other times, cultural studies and, you know, their laptops. So we then end ourselves, or rather modern disciplines have given us a right to be ignorant of reality or to dismiss reality or at the worst, push that reality away from us and apportion it to people or to fields which are basically disciplinary fields. And so I have a right not to know about the catastrophe that befell us because it belongs to cultural studies. It, you know, it belongs to radical political economy. I'm not, you know, I'm a sociologist, you know, who studies, you know, some other things. So I want to suggest that Intersectionality somehow mirrors this tendency in modern disciplinary knowledges to create disciplines that exist in their pure form. And then come together with other disciplines in multidisciplinary endeavors. So, what is common to all of these fields that I have mentioned above, you know, of race, belonging to cultural studies and gender to, you know, gender studies. What is common in all of these fields is the supposition that gender, race, and class can ever exist in its pure form. Now, I want to move away, you know, from this comparison with modern disciplines by drawing one last lesson that, you know, it may teach us, which is that we know why disciplines insist on exercise, or rather on existing in pure form. Each discipline, we are told, and at some other times we tell people when we go in front of students, we tell them that every discipline must have its own exclusive subject matter. It must be able to draw a boundary around a certain social phenomenon, if it's a social science discipline. It must be able to draw a boundary around a particular social phenomenon and claim that phenomenon as a, its own exclusive subject matter that other disciplines do not study. And so anthropology must have its own exclusive subject matter that is an exclusive preserve of those who practice the discipline. 
So the point I'm trying to make is that race, class, and gender as social relations are never to be found anywhere in a pure form. I'm going to demonstrate with an alternative. What is the alternative to intersectionality? I'm going to demonstrate with that alternative to intersectionality that a much more useful way intellectually and for the purposes of political praxis, a much more productive way is to, when one sees gender, one must already see race. When one sees race, one must already see gender. Or when one sees class or capital, one must already see gender. All of these things are expressions, you know, of the other. Now, the first attempt, I'm, I haven't gotten quite to the alternative that I want to suggest to you, but I want to first look briefly at certain attempts at actually, you know, surmounting this compartmentalization of lived experience, which is not lived in that way. Because a black female who experiences racism does not know at what point to say, at this point I was exp experiencing racism and then I started experiencing, you know, gender discrimination in one experience. Those things are experienced all at once together at the same time. But let, I, let me try, let me try that and, and, and suggest some previous attempts at surmounting this compartmentalization, you know, um, this compartmentalization, you know, of the different, you know, experiences. Now, Marxists, and perhaps the concept has been used much broader than Marxism now, have turned to the concept of the articulation. Understanding articulation as the joining together and giving expression to. Understanding articulation as the joining together and giving expression to have turned into the articulation, you know, in the in the social experience or the articulation, you know, of the social experiences. Now, the concept of an articulatory practice is useful to a certain extent. What it is unhelpful with is that it does not or it remains ahistorical. It remains ahistorical because it does not tell us how the joining together happens. It says that, yes, there is the joining together and the giving expression to, but what it is unable to explicate is how the joining together happens because the process itself of the joining together is determinant of the articulation itself. To try and explain a little clearer, how you join things together matter, because depending on the sequence of the joining together, you might still end up with what is called primary contradictions and secondary contradictions. So what the limitation of the articulation is that it still allows us a possibility of ending up with certain contradictions in society, be it gender or race, assuming a primary status as a primary contradiction and the other being considered only a secondary contradiction or an expression, a secondary expression of the primary contradiction. But for the interest of time, I'm going to rush to the alternative that is perhaps, uh, I must say, not original to me, it is inspired by you know, a feminist scholar called Himani Banerjee. Himani Banerjee has two important texts that have inspired my thinking away from articulation towards the concrete. One of the works is titled Building from Marx, Reflections on Class and Race. The other is titled Thinking Through, Marxism, Feminism, and Class. 
those are the two texts that have inspired my thinking about, you know, um, the concrete as a much more useful way of thinking about the experiences, you know, of the core presence of equally so, the core presence equally so of gender, race, and class. Now, before we get to the concept of the concrete, and I may summarily define it so that as I do the other things I want to do, you understand what Himani Banerjee and I extend from Himani Banerjee, you know, the, the notion of the concrete, which of course she takes from Marx, um, particularly the Grundrisse. Marx talks about the concrete in the following sense. Or directly, he defines the concrete as, and I quote, the concrete is concrete because it is the concentration of the many determinations. The concrete is the concrete because it is the concentration of many determinations, hence the unity of the diverse, such that, end of quote, such that at the end of that concentration of the many determinations, you do not see each individual determination. And so this is the concept of the concrete that I want to suggest as an alternative to the notion of intersectionality. But why do we opt for this concept of the concrete as given to us by Marx and my encounter with it, you know, in the feminist scholars' work, in the feminist, in the work of the feminist scholar Himani Banerjee? It is that it allows us acknowledge a, a few simple facts that gender, race, and class are not perennial categories. They've not always existed. People have not always been gendered the way they are gendered today. People have not always belonged to the classes that they belong to today, just as it is that people have not always belonged to the races that they belong to today. All of these things are social constructs that emerge together with, and at the same time, with Europe's transition into capitalist modernity. In fact, these are categories that are thrown up by capitalist modernity. And so they make sense only from the moment when the West becomes modern capitalist. Now there is something, there is something to be said then about the supposition beginning a struggle from an imposed identity, but wanting to assume that that is your original identity. The gendered identities we inhabit are created by modern capitalism. We must first repudiate them at that point before we go into the concrete. But so that I do not digress, the point I want to make is that the concept of the concrete allows us to recognize that these are social constructs. These categories are social constructs that emerge at the moment when the world become modern capitalist or when capitalist modernity sets in. So this is why race is a function of modern race science. Gender is a function of gender, you know, social relations that emerge within modern capitalism, just as it is that class is itself a function of capitalism. Once we recognize that fact, that all of these identities are social constructs that are thrown up by modern capitalism, or what I prefer, modern, uh, capitalist modernity. Once we realize that they are thrown up together at the same time, we will realize that historically, that's why I've said intersectionality is wrong conceptually, historically, and socially. We will realize that historically, there has never been an articulation of race or an articulation of gender outside of capitalist social relations. All of these are themselves expressions of capitalist social relations. And so the notion of the concrete must be understood properly. It is not concrete because it is empirical or it is 
an object. It is concrete because these are social relations. These are social relations that have historically been constituted. That's why they are concrete. So if we begin from that point that there has never been in the history of these concepts a moment where you encounter gender as gender, where you encounter you know, class as class, where you encounter race as race, who then realize that actually each of these is an expression of the other. Race is an expression of gender. Class is an expression of gender. And, you know, um, including all the three. I want to come a little closer to the con concept of, 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 the concrete so that, you know, uh, but before I do so, can I get a sense of how much time I have so that I know, you know, how much material I can cover? Five minutes left. Okay. That's fine. So we've made the point that the concrete is the concrete, not because it's an object, not because you know it's it's empirical it's concrete because these are social relations and we've made the point that the concrete is concrete following from marx because it is a concentration of many determination now we must emphasize the social character of the concrete this is the point that i want to end at so the concreteness of the concrete is that it is determinate, as I've said, you know, of social relations. Now, these different articulations of the modern humanitas, race, class, and gender, are just but particular expressions of the larger modern humanitas, or the character, the complex character of the modern, you know, humanitas. In fact, it is unavoidable. The point I must emphasize is that it is unavoidable for the modern human subject to be otherwise other than as gendered, as classed, and as racialized because the boilerplate, so to say, for a lack of a better term, the, the, the boilerplate of modern, you know, of the modern society is dependent on those identities. And so you come into the world, for a lack of a better expression, we come into the modern world already allocated into these, you know, different categories, but they do not exist as different categories. They exist as expressions of each other. So, our struggle to change the world cannot succeed, particularly for us, the black colonized, cannot succeed unless we see class for what it is, which is that it is indeed dependent on the economy, but it exceeds the economy. Or capital is dependent on the economy, but it exceeds the economy because capital is dependent on the devaluation of female bodies in order for it to be able to exploit those bodies worse than men's bodies. But it is not just women's bodies that capital is able to exploit worse than other bodies. It is women's bodies of a particular race. Now, capital itself finds that work already done and gives expression to it. And so it is for that reason that I must end because of time, you know, with this particular ending that I draw from Himani Banerjee. And I want to quote, struggles that have arisen or rather that have riven the world of feminist theory reveal that the category of woman in its desocialized and dehistoricized deployment has helped to smuggle in the political agenda, to smuggle in 
the political agenda of middle class white women and hidden the relationship of dominance that some social groups of women, particularly white women, hold with regard to others. I thank you very much. Yeah, gratitude to both our uh, conversation starters. Um, just so that we, you all know, um, we, we, we had um, the desire uh, to have um, an, another speaker, a woman, um, and we had several attempts um, and we sadly <laughs> couldn't secure um, uh, our third speaker. Uh, but the intention is to allow um, people to self-identify and join the conversation and, and continue as conversation um, uh, uh, contributors uh, or, or really, uh, you know, interlocutors on this theme. Um, but we're really grateful to our two speakers, uh, Professor Adam Haupt and Dr. Loazi Lushaba. And uh, I mean, really just the key uh, points uh, that I picked up uh, and I, I'm hoping that um, as we continue uh, with this uh, uh, with this conversation, uh, the, the 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 lessons we are learning, all of us uh, contribute um, to how we humanize each other, uh, not only at the University of Cape Town as in the campus, uh, but where we find ourselves in society. So, Adam, thank you for uh, taking us through. Um, the, you know, understanding of the difference between systemic racism and interpersonal racism, uh, prejudice otherwise, um, and also thinking about systemic racism uh, in the way that it advances piracy uh, within the academy through the logics of intellectual property rights um, and uh, really insisting that um, it would be difficult to decolonize the academy without attending uh, to the fact um, that we are constrained um, by, by the corporatized uh, university. Uh, Dr. Lushawa, uh, Lushawa uh, uh, Luazi, um, thank you uh, also for highlighting uh, the fact that um, we have uh, a fragmentation of, of lived experience or identities mirroring the fragmentation of the knowledge project, both being products of coloniality and capitalist modernity. Uh, and you really extended our thinking uh, by interrogating intersectionality and its conceptual limits and, and uh, really highlighting the need to locate concepts within historical uh, and political context.